We're going to move on now to our um, first plenary session of the day. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to um, introduce our next speaker, Professor Richard Harding. Richard is the Herbert Dunhill Chair and the Director of the Centre for Global he Health Palliative Care at the Cicely Saunders Institute um, in London. Richard has a background in social science and is really interested in person-centred care for those with serious illnesses. And I'm really pleased that Richard has chosen to spend some of his career bringing his methodological rigour into the world of children's palliative care, where we desperately need some high quality um, research out outcomes to measure both clinical care uh, and to use in, in the research setting. I should also say that Richard very kindly joined us from his holiday today, um, so thank you Richard. Um, and he's going to talk to us about um, towards the development of a children's palliative care outcome scale, what are the children, young people and parents telling us? So over to you Richard. Thank you so very much. It's such a pleasure to be with you today and to celebrate the work of the Martin House Research Centre. I would really uh, acknowledge the work that you've conducted to get to this stage because to achieve that level of um, external funding for palliative care research for children and young people really requires you to make a really compelling argument to funders and to write the best science so to have achieved this is absolutely incredible and I'm really really honoured to be with you all today. So I'd like to little to take the title that Lorna's given us today to think about the work we've been doing on children's outcomes work and to really start by thinking about why we're doing this now uh, you know I'm speaking on the back of Naveed's video which I think brilliantly laid out why research mattered I think he gave us a really really clear argument about research for better care so I'd like us to think about that better care <clears throat> in the context of quality so what does quality care look like is my first question that I want us to think about this morning. Well, there are many aspects to quality care. The Institute of Medicine talks about it being safe, effective, patient-centered, efficient, timely, and equitable. And I'd really like us to think about that middle phrase of patient-centered. And then the second definition of, of patient-centered care helps us to think about it being organized around people rather than diseases. So it's around your health needs and your expectations rather than your disease. The WHO definition of person-centered care when we're thinking about quality takes us a little further. So it's not just about the patient or the person living with a condition, but it's about the people around them. So we start to adopt the perspectives of individuals, families and communities so that you're participants in health systems, not just recipients of them. And it's about your needs, your preferences, and being holistic, which is, of course, in palliative care, a term that we understand very well. And then Epstein helps us think again about that idea of holism. So you're thinking about an individual as a complete being rather than just being about the disease. So this journey towards person-centered care, which of course palliative care really demonstrates, is really about good quality care. And I chose this picture here because it helps us think it's not just about the child, it's about the child and the family, it's about where they live, their home, about the things that make them happy, where they like to go, the things that they enjoy. So person-centered care and our route to uh, child-centered outcomes really is about uh, exemplifying person-centeredness. So if we all believe that we want to have good quality care and we want it to be person-centered, now the question is, how are we going to achieve this? Well, the task for person-centered care is really for us to get to know the patient as a person and to recognize their individuality. And then we need to show that if we give the right care to the right person at the right time, we can make changes in somebody's health status. So really, if we're going to be person-centered and we're going to give the right care and we're going to improve somebody's well-being, we have to be able to show that we can measure that and show a change. 
So the question, first of all, is how do you know what matters to the patient and their family? Now, of course, in palliative care particularly, the clinical assessment is really detailed. You take a detailed social history to try to understand the person and what matters to them. The problem with that is a, a detailed clinical assessment every time can be very long. <clears throat> it can be fairly unstructured in the sense that you don't always ask the same thing every time. Continuity is a problem because you can't really always compare back to the last clinical assessment. <clears throat> and it doesn't always include aspects of measurability, that idea from Donna Beddy and that if we are able to change somebody's well-being, we need to be able to demonstrate a change in that. So it has to be measurable. So a potential solution to these challenges and to arrive at that position of person-centered care is the idea of a patient-centered outcome measure or a patient-reported outcome measure. So it's a brief measure of what really matters to the, the patient and the family. And it helps us to identify, A, what matters to this person right now, what are the most important symptoms and concerns. And also, if we do it repeatedly over time, we can show how things are changing. And if we use the right measure at the right time and we use that data, that's the most important thing. It's not about asking the questions alone. It's about using that information. If we use that in practice, what we can actually do, and the evidence is very, very clear from a number of studies across conditions, not just in palliative care, but if you use these tools and you use them properly with the patient and the family, and you think about their answers and you build care around that, it can improve communication. It can make staff more aware of a patient and a family's problems. So in our context, symptoms and concerns, and you can actually improve outcomes. So you can improve somebody's well-being by using these tools in routine practice. So this is a very exciting potential for us to really achieve some of our goals. So what about outcome measurement in the context of palliative care for children and young people? So some of you may know Lucy Coombs, who is a clinical nurse specialist at the Marsden in children's palliative care. For her master's degree with us at King, she did a systematic review to look at the measures which are out there already to measure child-centered outcomes and to see if they're correct for, for children attending palliative care or hospice services. Do they measure the right thing? Now, there are a number of quality of life and related measures out there for children and young people, but what Lucy Coombs was able to show is that actually, when you look at the validation of those measures, there is currently no measure which measures what's relevant to children receiving palliative care and the specific symptoms and concerns that they face. So this was a really important turning point for us all to realize that actually, there's nothing out there we can take off the shelf. We need to take this work on if we're going to advance outcome measurement in this field. So the first thing to do, if you're going to measure, you need to ask children and ask young people, ask the families, ask the people in their care teams, what matters in the context of children and young people's palliative care. So when we look at what we know about what matters, Ibn Amisango from the African Palliative Care Association in Uganda, asked this question for both her master's and then her PhD with us at King's. She conducted a systematic review. So basically looked at all the evidence of what we know about the things that matter to children and young people who are living with life limiting and life threatening conditions. She did that search in 2016 and she found there were 81 studies, which is great. I would note when you look at those 81 studies that 68 of those came from high income countries. So largely Europe and North America, and also the vast majority of those were in cancer. And the other thing which I think is really important for us to note here, and you know, we hear about Martin House and what you're doing, so you're really working against this tide, is that actually 24 of those studies had not asked a child. So we're saying what matters to children and young people, but not actually asking them because there has been a bit of a history in the methods of not asking the children. So we also realize that that's, uh, that's something that we wanted to do differently. So when we looked at what matters in, uh, in the main domains of what uh, Eve found in the review, the main domains that we, that we would recognize in palliative care according to the WHO definition, so they can be largely classified as physical concerns, psychological concerns, social concerns, and existential or spiritual concerns. And I'll take those first. So things like symptom distress, um, 
physical function, treatment related concerns, emotional, cognitive and behavioural concerns in the social domain, things like activities of daily living, life values, relationships, and then some of the existential and spiritual concerns about the future, meaning of illness, spiritual growth, and of course, those key uh, domains and properties of resilience and coping. There are, of course, quality of care and practical concerns. That's slightly different. That's not a health outcome. Those are things that we would call uh, patient reported experiences. And I would note that with uh, the team at York, led by Lorna and Bryony, we are working with some of this data because, of course, it's really important ethically when children, young people and their families have given us this data that it gets used. So we're focusing at King's on the prom, so the outcomes, those first four domains, the quality of care and the practical concerns. The team at York are looking at a patient reported experience measure. Absolutely delighted to work with a great team and, and that data will be used. So uh, the other thing that Eve noted in her systematic review is that things change as the child ages. Of course, the challenge in outcome measure for children and young people is that, of course, what matters and needs change rapidly and quite significantly from birth to the age of around 18 years. So Eve tried to look at what might be some of the core domains and how they change or add over time. So she noted that for the youngest, age zero to five, issues around procedural pain, ability to feed and play. Moving on to the group six to nine, concerns around sharing feelings and then an, an identity and uh, uh, a self-awareness of maybe being different. Age 10 to 14, starting to think around issues around self-image, more emotional concerns and wanting to engage in peers. And then from 15 onwards, more concerns around fatigue, worry and of course disclosure as you become a more independent individual sharing your own information then you have to become the agent of your own disclosure so i'm not she's not saying in this review that these problems can't happen at any age but there are general themes showing how these problems and concerns slightly change over time so a new uh, a new paper that uh, has just come out of the cpos team and i'd, I'd kind of would like to acknowledge everybody on this authorship is how you construct a meaningful questionnaire for a child or a young person that's going to enable them to really participate in that meaningfully. We're going to have uh, a valid measure. So this is beyond children and young people's palliative care. This systematic review looked at all the evidence. If you're going to do health outcome measurement for children and young people, what are the methodological considerations you need to take on board? And Lucy's included in her review issues around recall periods. So how long back can a child meaningfully remember and recall about their symptoms and concerns? How do you scale the format? So what kind of response levels do you need? How should you complete it? You know, for example, paper and pencil, who with? And how can you really uh, enable children to participate? So there are a number of recommendations that have come from our paper. The first being that absolutely you must not just develop the questionnaire, and then you must move on to cognitive interview studies, and I'll talk about that a little more, but you really need to talk with children and young people about how the questionnaire is constructed, how they will answer the questions, how it's working for them, and then the full psychometric testing, and so all the questions about validity and reliability, responsiveness, which underpin a, a valid measure, then have to be conducted. It's not just about designing the questionnaire, you then need to test it. And then some of the different issues for different age groups, or this may be a developmental stage as well. It's not just about age, of course. So for younger children, it may be hard for them to distinguish between maybe one, two, three, four, five responses on a questionnaire. It might be easier for them to have maybe a yes, no, or a one, two. And then once you reach about seven, the evidence suggests that you can have three point responses on a questionnaire. The recall period should be quite short, so no more than 48 hours for those five to seven because they can't really accurately recall uh, earlier than that. You may be entirely un unsurprised to hear that uh, patient reported or child centered outcome measures should have a computerized version, absolutely, of course. Proxy measures are needed for those under five because they find it too difficult to communicate uh, formulate, understand a question, formulate a response and communicate that. So proxies, so uh, could be a sibling, could be a, a parent caregiver, could be a clinician will need to answer on their behalf. 
measures should be visually appealing to improve acceptability. So making it look engaging is really, really important. And then, of course, when you analyze this data and report it, you have to report it by your developmentally appropriate age band so that the, the measures are going to differ according to the child specific age or developmental stage. And we need to analyze and report according to that. And then you need to think about those different versions across all of those groups and make sure that you have appropriate and valid versions. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you're at all engaged in developing measures. So I just wanted to share this with you. I'm not going to go into lots of detail. It's a complicated slide, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what this involves. So the thing that always <laughs> concerns me most, if I'm in a conversation with somebody and somebody says, oh, we're going to develop a questionnaire, because the development of questionnaires is incredibly complex science. It's rapidly changing. I don't think any of us are always on top of the science because there is new knowledge all the time. But really, to summarise what we're doing, the, the, the journey that we're on with all of these fantastic partners in developing the Children's Palliative Care Outcome Scale is this. This is the standard process. So first of all, you do your systematic review to show that, yes, actually, a new problem is needed. And then you have to do all of your um, qualitative work with children, young people, patients and carers, siblings, healthcare professionals, commissioners. We've done all of that to understand what really matters. Then doing the systematic review to understand some of the questionnaire design issues, then going on to define the concept exactly what is it we are measuring, because if you're not clear what the concept is that you're measuring you're unlikely to do so accurately. Then building the conceptual model which you believe your tool is going to measure. Then we've been doing Delphi surveys with uh, family members children clinicians stakeholders to understand what their priorities are. Then we've had a series of very, very long item generation meetings, which have been absolutely fantastic with parents, with advice from children and young people advisory groups, with clinicians, with advocates coming together, bringing together all of that science to come up with the items. Now we're moving into the cognitive interviews. So talking with children, and young people and their parents with our draft questionnaires to help them to help us see if we've constructed it correctly and if they can be used appropriately. Then we've got to consolidate all those revisions and then we've got to go out and we've got to do the full use and get children, young people and their teams completing these measures. And then we need to look at the data to check that the validity, reliability, responsiveness, et cetera, are confirmed. So this is a huge undertaking and I would absolutely say that it's only working because we have a fantastic team of really dedicated individuals, each of which bring a unique perspective which is essential in making this work happen. So um, I'm going to share some unpublished data with you now. So I, while you're tweeting away the conference today, if I could just ask you to hold back on the tweeting, you'll know when not to tweet because we've got that little red circle with the uh, red line through the tweeting bird. So if you could uh, not tweet any of those slides, I'd be most grateful. So our recruitment is complete, I'm really glad to say, and to the team, who've done fantastic work going out, doing the interviews, but also to the clinicians who have referred patients and, and families and the children, the young people and the families who have just so brilliantly engaged in, in what we're trying to do. And we're hugely grateful to that. I would like also to share with you some of the commonalities and common experiences when we think about this globally. I, I'm enormously privileged uh, I'm grateful to run a global health centre in, in palliative care and to work with a number of people in the paediatric world, in different parts of the globe. Here's some what data I'd like to share with you, collected by Eve Namisango as part of her project, which was originally originated by Julia Downing at the African Palliative Care Association to develop a CPOS in Africa. Eve interviewed 61 children and young people in four African countries, ranging from seven to 17 years. You can see here that, uh, of course, this being an African study, around a fifth of the children were living with HIV, but there was a range of conditions in her sample. And when we look at the data published by Eve, we can see, again, the same domains, physical concerns around pain and symptom distress. We can see similar psychosocial concerns around family and social relationships, 
ability to engage with age appropriate activities like playing, like being able to go to school, existential concerns, children worrying about the future, and questions about healthcare quality, wanting child and adolescent friendly services. And this quote from a caregiver, age 23, said, she also tells me to take her back to school. She keeps referring to other children who are attending school and asks me to take her back to school. She is bed bound and is sad so because she cannot play. I thank God she's able to laugh and ask for what she wants. So I've shared this data with you from Africa because I think what we're really seeing is, yes, of course, things are going to vary according to context and to some degree, maybe according to condition, but actually there are global concerns for children and young people who are living with life-threatening and life-limiting illness. And I think the more we work together, the more we can achieve for children everywhere. So the next steps, the cognitive interviews are starting now. So cognitive interviews are a really, really important part of questionnaire development, making sure that the participant in your survey can actually understand what you've written, that the response formats are correct, that they read and interpret the question the same way you intended it to be. Can the recall period work? Is there anything that appears to be missing in this? Is there anything that appears to be irrelevant? Is this acceptable and feasible to be used in your day-to-day -day practice? And a lot of this is about reading aloud techniques. So you ask the participant to read the questionnaire aloud and to, to speak aloud as they formulate their response. Then we're gonna be moving into the full psychometric testing phases to really test the validity. Does it measure what we say we, we think it measures? And is it reliable? So can it measure it accurately? And then also testing responsiveness, which really asks if the child's health status changes, can that be picked up in the measure? Does the measure score also change? So we've achieved an enormous amount to date, an enormous amount still to do. This funding comes from the European Research Council, but also is achieved through enormous partnership that we're very, very grateful to. Um, I also just wanted to share some other stuff, which I think is related. Uh, I just wanted to share, we have another study called SKIP, which is about childhood bereavement. And because I think there's a key message here about involvement, what do children want? So this has been led by Steve Marshall, who's a um, research active social worker at King's in and particularly interested in children and young people in palliative care. And Steve has looked at when children are facing bereavement of an adult, what do they actually want? And his review has just been published. And it showed that when we look at the data, children actually want agency. They want to have some control and participation, but they're often shielded from the experience of the, the dying adult and they're excluded from communication and discussions by adults. But they themselves are going through an emotionally demanding uh, experience and they themselves have caregiving responsibilities within the family. And children are not passive in the process. They are developing their own coping strategies and they want to be involved. So I think there's a wider message here about children wanting to be involved and having, having views and experiences which are useful. And we saw that absolutely from Naveed at the beginning. And also uh, Steve and Anna have just published this paper on um, developing a palliative care children and young people's advisory group, re really building on this idea that children of course can be involved. And I know you're doing this work at uh, Martin House really successfully. And uh, th that paper also reports that the unique voices of children and young people should be considered and valued. So I just wanted to share with you because I think it really supports what you're doing at Martin House. So my final slide, I think we are on a shared journey to quality, quality that we can demonstrate through child-centered and family-centered outcome measures. So where are we heading? Well, I really truly believe that CPOS is going to enable children, young people and their families to rapidly identify their most burdensome symptoms and concerns. That's what CPOS is going to be able to do for us. We're going to be able to work with clinicians to say, these are the things that are bothering me right now. And this is how much burden I'm experiencing. So this is where we need to focus. Healthcare professionals are going to have valid data from this rapid assessment that's going to enable them to monitor outcomes over time. Services are going to have ready data to access, to, to identify what's working well and also where there's a need to focus. And I've particularly done this a lot in sub-Saharan Africa with palliative care teams when they really have valued access to data to see which symptoms may need to have some focus and quality improvement. 
And in the UK now for adults, this is absolutely routine that the adult pause is used in, in standard practice and drives assessment and care. I think what we've seen from children family involvement is what could be really exciting for the future is that service users can be part of the quality improvement cycle. So looking at the outcomes and the experiences which are also going to be work, working with York on, but actually when we're working at how to improve quality, service users can absolutely be part of that process. I think for the future, and again, you know, congratulations to Martin House on the grant income you have. I think the future is going to be even more exciting because once we have a, a valid measure, evaluating the effectiveness of care and care models is going to be possible. From a funder perspective, funders can be informed by data and evidence. And the last thing which I think is hugely exciting and I would urge you all to reflect on is that we can become part of a global network which is focused on children, young people, families and quality. And I just leave you with this data from the latest WHO and World Hospice Palliative Care Alliance Global Atlas of Palliative Care, which shows that the vast majority, over 97% of children in need of palliative care live in low middle income countries. So I'm hugely impressed with what Martin House is doing. And I think the more we work in partnerships globally, the more children can benefit from what's being done. So thank you so very, very much for the invitation to be with you all today. Thank you, Richard. It was an amazing presentation showing the amount of work for you and your team and the progress that you've made. We don't have a huge amount of time for questions, but there are three questions from our parent representatives all around the same topic. So I just wanted to ask that if that was OK. Mm. Um, so it's around Jason and Christy have asked, how do these methods of attaining children's views take into account those with neurological or cognitive differences, and particularly those without verbal skills? Yes, so I mean that's that's one of the challenges and of course what you're always trying to fight is inherent bias in your samples, so what do you do to ensure that you're not, not just identifying the symptoms and concerns of those who are easiest to interview. So now there always has to be some limitations, you can work as hard as you can with, you know, we work with speech and language therapists, with educational psychologists, with play therapists to enable children to communicate as far as possible. But sometimes it's about making sure that you oversample proxies for these children, because if you use every mechanism you can to identify their needs, but there are limitations in your sample, then you then have to start looking at alternative methods. And of course, one of the criticisms that children and young people are not always consulted, but sometimes to make sure that their views are represented, then we, then we do have to use proxies just to broaden out that sample. Thank you, Richard. That's that's really helpful. We do unfortunately have to move on because we do have some other questions for you. But can I just take this opportunity to thank you again, both for the work that you're doing, but also for taking the time out to come and, and present to us today, Richard. Thanks so much.